and many thanks for joining us from all over the world today to discuss how can community-led nature-based technologies help us adapt to climate change. The session is co-organized by Practical Action, IED, Forest Farm Facility, and the Wetland International. I'm Xiaoting Ho Jones, Senior Researcher at IED, and I'll be your moderator today. And pardon me if you see my eyes starting all over the place because I'm trying to monitor many different screens, but I'm actually looking at many of your faces. So as Charlotte recommend, if you could turn on your video, do turn on your video so we can see you, everyone can see you. Um, so for those participants who haven't introduced yourself yet, please do so in the chat box. And this is great to see so many people from so many parts of the world. And as we know, 2020 has been nothing but special as forest fire devastated the west coast of the US. The locust swamps ravage the farms in Africa, floods disrupts lives of millions of people in Asia. I guess this year really bring home the message louder and clear that our society's future is really interlinked and very much interdependent with nature and we need to work with nature to be resilient to climate change impacts. So in today's session, we hope to share and discuss with all of you how local communities have been championing nature-based adaptation technologies that embrace the interconnectivity between our society and the nature to deliver integrated solutions for the pressing challenges of both climate change and the biodiversity loss. We'll also explore opportunities and challenges for supporting and scaling up those locally championed nature-based technologies. We will first hear uh, from a panel of four speakers who will share technologies used in marine, forest, agriculture, watershed ecosystems. They will also help bring in some reflections from a series of roundtables organized by our co-host leading up to the workshop session today. Some of you may have participated in those roundtables, so welcome back. Please feel free to also share your reflections from those roundtables in the chat box at any time. For those who were not able to join those roundtables, you can find the recordings of those on Hoover platform, but please view them only after the workshop session. And most importantly, we want to use today's time to hear from all of you. So the session will have 30 minutes devoted to breakout groups where everyone will have a chance to share your perspectives. The groups will then come back together to share reflections before we close the session. So one of the few advantages of virtual meetings is that gives those of us who enjoy multitasking more opportunity to interact. So throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat box to share your reflections, ask questions to each other, all the speakers, and we'll try to also have a conversation going on in the chat box while people present or, or talk through via video. So that's enough for me. Let's start the session by learning from four panelists who hosted the roundtable discussions. So you may have seen or heard their voices before. And they all have a lot of experience in working with local communities implementing nature-based adaptation technologies. So really great that they can join us. So I would first like to invite Anadel Kabamban, who is joining us from all the way from Philippines today. Anadel is a program manager for Wetland International's Partner for Resilience Project and head office of Wetland International Philippines. She's a trained natural scientist who has dedicated her career to linking science with policy and practice. She will bring us to the beautiful coastal zones of Philippines today. So over to you, Anadel. Thank you. Wetlands International has been in the Philippines since 2015, and uh, the first investment we have is uh, in Tacloban. You may remember in uh, uh, 2013 that there was this uh, extreme event that hit Tacloban. And so the government of the Philippines and the government of ne the Netherlands came together and organized stakeholders and work with uh, uh, the Wetlands International and other agencies. We introduced mangrove replanting as one of the nature-based solutions in the restoration of the 100 meter belt along the coastline for the protection of the coastline to extreme events to storm surges. We replanted uh, this uh, abandoned fish pond in this photo with the mangroves and with the community in this uh, locality. This uh, mangrove replanting as a nature-based solution is part of the coastal zone protection strategy of uh, 
Tacloban, Palo in Eastern Leyte, Philippines. Next slide, please. From the learnings we have in uh, this uh, locality, we wanted to share these in another coastal zone. This is the coastal zone near Metro Manila. Uh, the photo here shows uh, Manila Bay, uh, and uh, adjacent to the Manila Bay is a, a large coastline with a vast coastal zone, which is uh, uh, being a delta, is soft and also sinking. It's sinking because of the extraction of water. And there's also the storm surge happening during extreme events. And of course, there's a sea level rise with climate change. However, the sea level rise is, is lower than, the rate of sea level rise is lower than the sinking of the coastline in the northern coast of um, Manila Bay. And so we are introducing Building with nature approach. Building with nature approach is a combination of understanding of engineering solutions, engineering principles, ecological principles, and societal principles. For the ecological principles, we are going to introduce also uh, mangrove reforestation, especially in the fish ponds that have been abandoned for years. Uh, having earthen dikes, that is dikes made of mud and uh, grown over with, uh, with grass or uh, trees. And the room for the river, this is another nature-based solution, which is promoting the, the easements are on the banks of the river to be free from any infrastructure and to rehabilitate this, revegetate this, to ensure that uh, the banks are held together and uh, will filter also the sediments coming from the land. This uh, effort that we're doing is part of the master planning for the sustainable development of Manila Bay. Next slide, please. We are interested to, uh, as to accelerate the promotion of building with nature in Asia, in different countries, in Asia, including India, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And in the Philippines, uh, we are going to uh, promote this in different types of ecosystems, in the coast, in deltas, as well as in rivers, lakes, and urban environment. In this photo here is the map of the northern, detailed map of the northern part of Manila Bay, where we're going to introduce different nature-based solutions, including the reforestation of the mangroves, the restoration of mud floods, which are important for migratory birds, for water birds, as well as for shellfish, which is important for the communities to, to be able to glean for sustenance or to mm -hmm. harvest shellfish to sell to the market. So it's a basis for livelihood. So we are hoping that we will be able to uh, raise the necessary resources to implement this nature-based solutions within this coastal zone with the communities. Next slide, please. On September 1, we had an informal roundtable discussion. We were few, but we had a, a lively discussion. We first talked about uh, the Top Town project for restoration in the Philippines, the non uh, NGP, National Greening Program. And part of that National Greening Program is also the restoration of the mangrove forest or beach forest along the coastline. Uh, but this being a top-down effort, it has uh, faced some um, unintended consequences. There was uh, a lot of money that was used for reforestation and uh, sometimes they were pushed to um, to, to undertake the uh, replanting to meet uh, quotas or targets. The good thing about this non-greening uh, program is the fact that uh, it's implemented with people's organizations at the local scale. So um, that's very positive and uh, it's also for, uh, live, for livelihood development. And the other example that was given is in South Africa, 
where replanting or reforestation is uh, is uh, rewarded with economic goods, uh, which is also very good for the community. And the third example was the use of uh, organic materials like uh, grass and uh, uh, rice husks for holding the bonds uh, in the coastline to uh, protect the coastline from um, flooding. Next slide, please. So we uh, came up with two uh, questions. How can we include the voices, the knowledge of the local people uh, in policy and planning? And how can we argue more for this conditionality in funding in projects? Next slide, please. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Annadelle, for giving such a detailed presentation, um, especially showcasing how mangrove is a very effective way to even think about uh, how we can link rural and urban EBA and a uh, quite good technology to think about how we can control coastal uh, storm surges. And, uh, with the, and then thanks for bringing in some of the roundtable discussion examples as well from all over the world. And the next, our next speaker will be Philip Kisoya. Uh, he is a national facilitator of the forest and the farm facility program in Kenya. Philip is an expert in landscape ecology with interest in community-based natural resource management. He will take us from the coast in Philippines to the forest in Kenya. Over to you, Philip. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a, a small presentation on the farm land inventory um, for sustainable timber management and community-based adaptation. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, I, I think it's self-evident that uh, smallholder farmers, uh, no, go back, please. Uh, I think it's self-evident that uh, smallholder uh, farmers are already facing um, socioeconomic uh, problems. So climate change is only exacerbating the already precarious nature of, of their livelihoods. And one other aspect is that the small holders also lack, um, you know, and organized groups to champion their interests um, and for, for them to be able to combat the effects of climate change. And the Forest and Farm Facility Program, uh, with, uh, with support from partners, is actually helping uh, these small holders to actually form groups so that they can get a voice and also be able to access these technologies to combat climate change. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, agroforest systems uh, is, is one of the systems that uh, FFF is promoting uh, as one uh, an approach uh, for community-based uh, adaptation. And um, for us to really understand um, the um, agroforestry uh, is that uh, we, we need to uh, get, so, sorry, and my slide is not, clear but uh, sorry, sorry sorry so um agroforest systems as i said is one of the uh approaches that we're using for community-based adaptation and for us to really um understand this is that uh, we really have to know what are the socioeconomic uh, benefits of this uh, of this approach and most importantly the provision of ecosystem goods and services uh, that are critical uh, for sustainable agriculture but I think we all know uh, that uh, most uh, of our smallholder farmers actually lack uh, information and on how to better, you know, understand the effects of climate change uh, and even the impacts of, of the interventions. They are doing quite a lot, but uh, when it comes to trying to measure all these efforts, uh, there's a lot of information lacking. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, um, so um, FAO uh, through the farm, farm facility program is actually promoting farmer on data. I think, and as I say, information um, is power. And uh, we believe that uh, if farmers uh, can add this information, uh, it's very critical in, in, in empowering them. 
much of the data that we have now uh, related to agriculture, climate change, is actually owned by government institutions, researchers, development agencies, and even worse, they're actually in forms or in language that not understood by farmers. I think we will all be talking about uh, involving communities in participatory monitoring and evaluation of community-based adaptation. But it's very important that we actually use the language, simple language that they understand. I don't think we can talk about community-based adaptation while at the same time talking about very complicated uh, carbon calculations uh, like the ant and others. It's good that uh, we break down some of these technologies in the simple way that the, the local communities, even the literate, could understand. Uh, we believe that this farm level data empowers the small old, smallholder tree farmers to state their significant contribution in achieving the national targets on forest and landscape restoration, climate change mitigation, and other related SDGs. And it also provides linkage to the National Red Plus framework, uh, the payment for ecosystem services. Uh, so with this information, uh, smallholder farmers are facilitated to lobby and advocate for better enabling policies. I think once they have this information, as, as I said earlier, information is power, they can be able now to leverage or to lobby for better support and even enabling policies for, for, uh, for their efforts in combating climate change. Next slide. Yes, so this is just uh, the process of uh, uh, how we conducted this because we, we piloted this program with the Tree Growers Association of Nyandarwa. Um, and basically, uh, and we started with the, you know, what we're saying is that management at scale requires information, which is often lacking. Uh, the producer led inventory is very cost effective, uh, sustainable, uh, and effective, and sustainable a sustainable way to get information. It, again, it uses commonly available tools and support uh, tailored for the local communities. And uh, it yields results in hands of the producers, useful for mapping, valuation, certification, business and business and business development uh, for, for sustainable uh, management of, of, the, of, of the timber trade that uh, I earlier talked about. Next slide. So this is a process of uh, actually conducting this success, a very simple uh, um, a process, uh, starting with the training, preparation of material sampling, data capture, uh, you know, measurement of, of, the, of the trees, so, uh, data entry, and very important is actually the product, you know, the use of this information, development of a bank of business plan. And with this business plan, they're able to access markets, they're able to maybe even try to start uh, valuing the ecosystem goods and services and provide and provide evidence numbers for policy dialogue. I think this is the result of trying to get this information and this information is actually supplied by the farmers themselves, not by development agencies or anybody. It's the information that's being delivered uh, by the smallholders themselves to the government. Next slide. Yes, and one of the products and of this exercise was the, was the development of the Tree Growth Association of Nyandarwa a business plan. And with all the data, a summary of the data, and, and the number of trees, uh, of various timber products from the farms, and even uh, an estimation of, of the carbon uh, sequestration uh, from, the, from, the, from the trees in their farms. So these are very important products that's coming from all these uh, exercise, simple exercise. And right now, this tree growth organization of Nyandarwa is actually using this tool uh, to assess for better markets, to negotiate for with the, with the timber and merchants and, and, and the timber industry for better markets of their products. So we believe that uh, the information already generated is already yielding some fruits and they are also engaging right now in serious engagement with the, with the players in the market. Next Thanks, slide. Philip. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, unfortunately, slide, okay. yeah, we do need to quickly move on now. Okay, thank you. I think, and as we are sharing the, uh, the UN decade of family, family farming and ecosystem restoration, we have to ensure that every tree counts. And this is what uh, we did to measure every tree. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Philip. And it's really interesting with that inventory technology that you mobilize all the communities and the, the local farmers to help you capture all the data and the, the effects of climate change. And then next, we will go to the farms in Africa with Harrison Manuma. Harrison is the monitoring, evaluation, and the learning lead for practical action in Southern Africa. He's a trained agriculture economist with a passion for linking indigenous people's knowledge with science. And that just also quickly to let all the speakers know there's some questions coming to you in the chat box. Feel free to answer in the chat box as well. And please, the next few speakers, please keep to on time so we can move swiftly as to the agenda. Thank you. Um, thank you, Xia Tong, and uh, good afternoon, morning, and evening, everybody. Um, uh, like uh, the, the facilitator mentioned, my name is Harrison and I work with Practical Action in Southern Africa. And our vision is a world that works better for everyone. And I've uh, specifically been working on projects that uh, aim to make farming work better for smallholder farmers, many of whom are women. And today I'll be sharing some of our lessons and experiences on how small seeds can feed a growing world. So what you see in the cover picture over there is a handful of a very uh, small seed from a crop that some of us might not even know. It's called Fonio and uh, it's from Ethiopia. It grows pretty well on poor sandy soils and it is a rapidly maturing cereal, probably the world's fastest. And uh, it is a gourmet grain rich in amino acids such as cysteine uh, that, are that is really found in, in cereals. Next slide, please. But however, for many generations, uh, you find that the majority of food produced in developing countries has come from uh, informally preserved and traded seed. Uh, this is mainly because many farmers like uh, Mariette, Maureen, and Tombizodwa, shown in the top left picture of the slide there, uh, cannot afford hybrid seed. And if they do access this hybrid seed, for instance, through subsidies, um, it is often not very adaptable to their climatic conditions and it requires high rates of external input use. So smallholder farmers um, do trade and exchange quite a diversity of crops, but most interestingly uh, is the fact that they are arguably the major custodians of native crops and land race varieties such as fonio that I mentioned earlier, and the number of local rice, sorghum, and other varieties. Unfortunately, um, these native crops have been defined as inferior, coarse, small, or poor people's crops, while foreign crops such as maize uh, in some parts of Africa have uh, been transformed into the convenient staples. And this has been through generations of breeding, food processing, uh, technology development, policy, uh, lobbying, and a lot of marketing and, uh, and advertising. Uh, but despite uh, shunning you know, uh, the, the, the native varieties, they really haven't died and they've continued to help um, many women farmers such as uh, Virginia in the bottom left picture there to feed themselves and their families uh, in the face of climate change. Um, next slide, please. So practical action for over six years now um, has been working with some of these vulnerable women and communities um, to promote community-based conservation, utilization, and management of climate-adapted crops and varieties. And um, we've been doing this working together with relevant government stakeholders. Um, we've helped kickstart participatory plant breeding processes that tap into the local knowledge and genetic resources whilst linking it with science and government's technical and institutional resources. So those are some pictures of farmer field schools, uh, participatory variety selections, and community seed fairs around uh, the native and land race uh, crops and varieties. Next slide, please. So some of the major results from this work and also what we think still needs to happen. Um, so between 2015 and 2018, our collaborative efforts saw the release of four cowpea and two pearl millet uh, locally adapted varieties. 
and uh, better access to these seeds has been a game changer for, for the farmers we have been working with. So from solely relying on a failing maize crop each season, women such as um, Tombi in the picture there, who is a 48 year old widow, have experienced improved nutritional diversity and security for their families. But however, we still feel that there's a lot that still needs to be done. Um, there's need for more collaborative research and documentation around farmer managed seed systems. Um, the policy environment in many countries is still not supportive for, 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 for the promotion of farmer crops and varieties. And the big question that we still have is how can farmer managed seed systems work better as a nature based solution for adaptation in more local communities around the world? Um, and also just to mention some of the varieties that were released from our work are accessible through the uh, International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Harrison, and uh, thanks for being so on time and uh, highlighting some small farmer-led and uh, women-led innovation in the farming uh, agriculture sector for conserving seeds as effective adaptation technology, but also that helps conserve agrobiodiversity. So next, we will visit the watersheds in Sudan with Rofaida Alzubai. Rofaida is the Knowledge and Communication Manager at Practical Action in Sudan. She's responsible for capturing and sharing practical actions, knowledge, and evidence to influence and inspire many others. So next, over to you, Rofaida. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, this is Rofaida Zubair, Knowledge and Communication Manager from Practical Action Sudan. So next slide, please. I'm going to go through this presentation to, to let you know how practical action was able to turn the desert green. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So most part of Sudan's are, are uh, of Sudan are arid and, and semi-arid zone that suffer from flooding and recurrent droughts due to the lack um, and their and their erratic rainfalls uh, due to as a, as a, an impact of the climate change. Water resources are among the most in 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 the in in the country. The average the annual uh, average rainfalls has declined to about 350 millimeters, particularly in the part of the North Darfur region, which is not enough for crop production. Next slide, next slide, please. And this is has caused um, uh, more dec declining in productivity and reliability. Uh, crops are failing, also causes desertifications, uh, internal migration and displacement. A lot of uh, young people has to leave their villages to go to the big cities where they can find other jobs because uh, farming is no longer uh, viable. And also created conflict over natural resources, especially the water resource between the farmers and the pastoralists. In order to overcome this, next slide please. In order to overcome these issues, Practical Action has a great experience applying the integrated resource uh, um, um, maniacs, such as um, constructing dams, as the one that you can see on the picture here, uh, uh, water diversion channels, terraces, bed bar technologies, and other environmental friendly technologies, because it's needed in, that, in such an environment, uh, and it's playing an important role um, such as uh, expanding the, the farming land, enhancing the soil fertility, recharging the groundwater, gallus controls, and, and a lot of environmental sustainability is needed. Not only water harvesting, but also uh, we also use um, agroecology to improve the productivity and adaptation. Uh, Diversification, planning, uh, and crop rotation is also taking place. Uh, agroforestry and using organic fertilizers, uh, establishing community uh, farmer field schools where, where farmers can earn and uh, can, can gain new knowledge. Um, also managing the environment uh, with planting community forests uh, using cash crops uh, such as uh, gum arabic trees, which is not only stopping the desertifications but also uh, providing uh, income 
another income for these communities uh, by by planting this type of uh, cash crop um, uh, cash crops. Um, uh, another important thing is consensus building between the upstream and downstream communities, which was also crucial in this process in order to avoid any disputes over the, the water utilization. Next slide, please. Uh, this approach, the, the water management approach, not just only um, ensure the efficiency in water management, but also to the equity and environmental sustainability because dams are designed in a way that distribute the water very systemat in a systematic manner and also uh, of, the, of the land. It's also, um, in order to ensure the, the efficiency and the success and sustainability of such a project, building the institutional capacity is, was, was really important and, and a key uh, to engage also the to create that links between the community and the policymakers, and to engage uh, the government authorities with with the community with the grassroots community groups. Um, next slide, please. This has shown that uh, a lot of farmers like um, Al Haf is the one that you can see in the picture who who has to flee from his village to Khartoum, the, the capital city of Sudan, in order to find a job. Now he, he was able to go back to his village and to, to, to do what he, he learned and he used to do, uh, what he's good at, which is farming, instead of doing other labor work. And that helps a lot of families that are no longer need to, to, to be broken. A lot of children ha are getting better um, and, and more nourished, rural communities, keep their young men um, and cities don't need to grow endlessly. What is more is that well managing the water resource has reduced the competition between the neighboring uh, groups. Next slide, please. We have, we have demonstrated at practical action, we have demonstrated that this approach is working and we won a, a large donations that funded other second phases of the project so that thousands of people has a better life now, but there's more, we need more people uh, to be reached. There are millions need to be reached. Uh, we are trying to make the case for, na for nature-based solutions that are helping the communities to adapt to the climate change, but only if they are taken to the scale. And my question to you is that, how can you, how we can make uh, sure that this is uh, happening and we are reaching more people with, with, with such um, um, alternative solutions that works better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rufaida, for showing us how integrated water resource management can also be an effective adaptation technology, taking into consideration how we can work across different sectors, agriculture, water, and forest. And uh, I think all the speakers showed us quite clearly that adaptation technologies does not, not really need to be high cost. They do not need to be designed or engineered just in a fancy lab. Often some of the most applied adaptation technologies join local community and the indigenous people's knowledge and work with nature and acknowledge the complexity and the interdependency between us and the nature. If it's truly owned and tried by local communities as shown by those speakers, then these technologies can be more effective in the long term and more likely to be taken up and benefit the most vulnerable communities. But they all also highlighted many different challenges and posed some questions to all of us as well. So uh, the next step is that we really want to hear from all of you by breaking into smaller groups to discuss three questions that you can see on the screen. Those questions have been highlighted by various speakers and they were also discussed as important point to, for further discussions through the engagement with a wide range of participants in the four roundtables I mentioned that led up to this workshop session. So just quickly, the three questions are basically reflecting on the example you just heard and your own experience. How can nature-based technology help community adapt to climate change? And what you, do you think are the advantages of those technology comparing to other technologies? Obviously, you can also discuss any disadvantages as well. And then the second question is how to scale up then those 
community-based and nature-based adaptation technologies. So as many speakers mentioned and emphasized, so they're not just islands of success. What are some of the important preconditions for that to happen? And then interlinked with the second question, many speakers talked about unfavorable policies. So what actually are the important policy enablers and the barriers for community to engage with or champion those nature-based adaptation technologies? What are some of the effective strategies to create enabling policy, enabling policy environment from your experience? So I will now also post the, all the questions into the chat box. And the, the facilitators, please also do so when you were assigned into different groups and we will see you back here in 30 minutes. Charlotte, over to you to assign people to the groups. Great, so I'm just going to um, open up the breakout rooms now. Um, breakout will, will, will go on for 30 minutes and you'll see a uh, six, 60 second countdown at the end of it. Um, so um, please click the button once you see uh, it open up um go into the breakout groups thanks very much waiting to see yeah i think everyone's back now so i hope you all had a great discussion uh, my group's discussion is really informative and thanks everyone now we would invite one person from each group to share uh, some top line messages from your group in under three minutes please but we will also invite all the participants to feel free again to use that chat box to share some of your key reflections, especially if you feel like it's not really covered by your uh, repertoires from your group. So do feel free to share as well. So first we'll go to Monisha from Practical Action. Now take, um, I, Chris will be Monisha, presenting on my behalf, thank you. Great, okay, Chris, over to you, please. I knew Manisha was going to say that. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the notes that Manisha has typed, so apologies for that. Uh, and the writing's too small, so I have to look at my own notes. Um, on the first one, I think there is a big issue. I think there was consensus that uh, nature-based solutions are advantageous. Um, but I think there was a big, big caveat. The caveat is, so long as people can benefit, and where it sometimes falls down. The ways that people can benefit is not well negotiated. Um, where is well negotiated nature-based solutions work? Well, urban or rural, where it's not well negotiated, then there's no sustainability. That's the huge carry away. We had examples of mangroves in in Philippines and, and seeds in Bangladesh on that. On the scale up, I think the overriding point was that nothing will work without community cohesion. And that needs community institution building. And that requires investment. And the problem is rushing things in a project way when you haven't got that community institution building in place. That groundwork is needed. It gives buy-in from the communities um, that is the only way to get scale up because it's from that that you link the benefits. On the, um, on the barriers and the enablers, definitely governments have a role to play because certain things are required for people to be able to develop nature-based solutions like land. If they haven't got access to land, if, if they haven't got right, certain rights, they, it won't happen. And there is a huge tension between what donors have money for and what communities need and what works on the ground. When we try and scale up what works on the ground, there's no funding for it. The things that are being funded haven't got the elements that work on the ground. Sorry, that was a bit of a rush from my notes. Maybe someone from the group might want to add. Thanks so much. And again, please, if you have anything to add, just put it in the chat group. Um, Mechanisms to incentivize people's engagement. That's where donors and scale up strategies can come in. Great. And uh, Rofaida, next over to you to report back from the group. Thank you. So uh, the, the group also talked about challenging is a great uh, scaling is a great challenge. 
and uh, also the need for more evidence showing that this is working for 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 the donors so that they can make the case for for, for adopting more um, nature-based solutions government engagement is also crucial for scaling and and uh, most of the group members have has agreed on this uh, one of um, also they have mentioned one of the important um, thing is the good communication uh, of the success story success stories uh, also they emphasize on the importance of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning uh, by doing exchange visits, visits or also using technologies due to the current situation of the uh, of the COVID-19 uh, using technologies such as WhatsApp and, and remote learning that also can help sharing experiences. Uh, involving the government uh, from the beginning will support also getting the support from the government into uh, forming policies uh, and that that can help in, in adapting. Uh, also, the, the 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 group also talked about that the government are the key player uh, in enabling policies, engaging them from the beginning, and having equal partnership is also needed. Um, also, the incentive uh, part is mentioned uh, in the group because they think that it can help incentive from the government and can help spark the interest um, in restoring the the ecosystem and engaging the communities. Um, all also recognizing the importance of the role of the local authorities at the same time the community themselves they they should be able to show the case of how they are adapting to the, the to the climate change to their own government so that they can enforce this um, this policy change that's all from my side feel free if you if you because the voice was breaking out feel free to add more if I have missed anything thank you that's brilliant. And uh, despite the technology difficulties, you, you've done the uh, report really well. Thanks so much, Rufaida. And again, uh, er anyone have anything to add, use the chat box. And next, over to Eve Allen. Hi, everybody. So in our group, we primarily discussed question number one and our consensus, which I think is the consensus of everybody is that one major advantage that NBS has over conventional approaches is that it's more holistic and it can produce multiple co-benefits for people and the environment. Um, and we also discussed how many of these nature-based adaptation technologies like agroforestry or mangrove restoration or integrated water resource management are actually old technologies that are being repackaged or rebranded as NBS, almost like old wine and new bottles. Um, and so that kind of led us to ask, you know, we need more clear definitions on what constitutes um, NBS as an activity or as an adaptation technology and somebody referenced the new IUCN standards um, and I did share the link in the chat box and so that could be useful for people. Another question that came up was how best to link NBS to financing mechanisms or to business development um, and so I think that's a question for people in the audience um, if they have any suggestions or any case study examples. That's everything from us. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Eve. And then I we go to Ben. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we had a good group, and uh, I hope I summarized their thoughts, uh, their thoughts accurately. Uh, we went. We were able to go through all of the three questions, albeit briefly. And if I had to summarize the the thinking. The, the major advantage um, of nature-based solutions from the, from the uptake and scale point of view is that uh, many of these things that we're talking about people, as Eve said and her group remarked, people are, are basically familiar with them. Uh, they're involved in them for their lives and their livelihoods. And we're talking about scaling up practices that already work or improving them. And so the, the barriers for uptake um, for farmers, for fishers, uh, for people who are involved in natural resources management are, are relatively lower than something high tech. Um, uh, fundamental was a, was a word that was used um, or foundational. Uh, in terms of scaling these up, um, yes, we talk about involving the private sector and uh, private enterprise is, is a good motivator. Kisoyan mentioned that, but, but also a lot of what we're talking about in the added value are public goods. 
Um, and so it's important to build local ownership uh, in government, particularly uh, for scaling up for the second question in local government. Um, and uh, then for the third question, enablers and barriers, well, uh, here we focused, although there are many of these, but here we focused uh, more at the, the national level. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that, uh, that often the making the case for this to a, to a national government has to do with an economic case. And it also has to do with, um, with finding a champion or, or a leadership that's receptive to this. So here uh, there's a good case for, for monitoring, uh, documenting and analyzing. Um, thank you. I think these are the, the major takeaways from my group. Many thanks, Ben. Um, and the uh, Anna Dow, next over to you. May I invite uh, Anna to please give the report? Anna Svensson. We lost her. Uh, no, I'm uh, here. Yeah, I wasn't, wasn't really ready for that, but I'll uh, do my best. I think a lot of what we've uh, discussed has already been mentioned. I think like everyone else, we, we acknowledge the, the value of nature-based uh, technologies and solutions. And uh, we discussed how they are often things that communities already do and already know, and therefore uh, the skills and the knowledge exists, and they can be quite cost-effective and, and cheap to uh, to use. Uh, we also talked about uh, scaling quite a lot and, and kind of discussed the challenges where something might work really well in one specific uh, location or ecosystem but doesn't necessarily work in other places and the value of kind of uh, in taking a solution that works in one place and then uh, tweaking it so that it works for other in other communities and other ecosystems as well. Uh, one of the things that were highlighted was the, the value of peer-to-peer um, -peer learning or local champions in that kind of process that uh, it might be better for a community, there might be more trust if um, the promotion of a specific uh, solution or technology comes from uh, community members who had used this rather than from from government or from NGOs and we, we kind of flag like how do you facilitate this peer-to-peer -peer learning and how do you uh, promote it and uh, ensure that people have the, um, the kind of evidence uh, and documentation needed to, to promote their, um, their solutions that work. Uh, another interesting thing that was flagged was around understanding behavior change. Um, so nature-based solutions often uh, seem to take a long time to show any real impact and results and uh, how do we how do we create more um, current and more direct incentives for communities to uh, to buy in and see benefits here and now rather than uh, have a have a more long-term um, impact that doesn't feel uh, quite real to to people who are um, uh, living here and now and dealing with challenges here and now. Uh, so that was also an interesting uh, discussion. Um, we, we touched upon um, policy uh, environment so on. We, we discussed quite a bit about the importance of um, identifying and utilizing the inf interface between national and nat uh, non-natural based solutions, so the kind of grey-green um, area uh, and to, um, to kind of use that to uh, speak to those that aren't already bought into the whole nature-based uh, solution um, approach. Um, yeah, feel free to, to add in the text box if I've missed anything that we discussed. Brilliant, that's great, Annadelle. And uh, next we go to Christine. Oh, thank you no. for voting. So our group, Naman, is reporting. Great, Naman, yeah. please go ahead. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we had a very wonderful group. Give just brief on each and every question, like question one. I 
think Nama is breaking in and out, unfortunately. Um, I'm not clear. Yeah, I, I can't really hear you. It's uh, quite intermittent. Oh, I don't know whether my network is the problem. Yeah, maybe, Christine, maybe can you help now? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, for question one, what came out was uh, that uh, the adaptation, the nature-based technologies are cost-effective. They are less expensive for communities to adopt and can be replicated easily. Then um, they also play a complementary role to complement other technologies and thus create a balance. Then uh, for question two, we began by highlighting the barriers for the uptake of nature-based solution and one of them was the lack of incentives so the group members recommended that we need to have incentives for communities to be able to scale up the nature-based solutions. Therefore, there should be a value attached to, to, to those uh, technologies. Then it was also highlighted that still funding is a major problem, whereby those technologies come up and they stop at pilot and not uh, scaled up. Therefore, it was recommended that we need to uh, build a concrete mass to lobby for government and other stakeholders to provide funding for nature-based uh, technologies so that they do not stop at pilot but are able to be replicated further. Then uh, uh, still on that note, there was an issue of capacity and also an issue of promoting uh, uh, of uh, local policies, ensuring that technologies are promoted that is through community champions, because if the communities do not know about the technologies, about their successes, they cannot replicate them easily. So uh, we thought that this can be done through using the community champions, using the train of trainees, and also exchange visits to where those technologies have worked. Then for question three, uh, we discussed and noted that nature-based solutions uh, should be aligned to the national uh, government policies, for example, the national adaptation plans, and show how they can help in the realizing the broader uh, objectives of such policies uh, so that they can create a buy-in from government to fund such technologies. And then another was also to create a movement of communities to ensure that they hold governments accountable to do the policy implementation. So. Uh, that is it from our group and any member can add on. Thank you. Great, thanks. And again, please do add in the chat box. I can already see some really good suggestions already coming through, so keep them coming. And then next we go to Sashen, please. Thanks so much. Um, some really lovely discussion in the group um, and thanks very much to my group members. Uh, a lot of the points have already been touched on. I think just really the, the emphasizing the co-benefits that emerge from nature-based solutions and the, the technologies. Um, we spoke, spoke a lot about the kind of enterprise development, restoration economy, business development uh, benefits as well. So sort of really emphasizing the socioeconomic side as well as the environmental side. Um, one of the points that was really important was how nature-based solutions can really build on indigenous knowledge um, and how that can be really integrated effectively. Uh, when we spoke about scaling, there was a lot of discussion about that kind of district, um, national and village level um, sort of integration and working collectively. There were some really nice examples about how villagers are able to engage at the district level um, through sort of exchanges and, and, and are involved in the integrated development planning at a district level. Uh, so really sort of community um, bottom up, you know, driven empowerment that's happening, um, but definitely more of that required to be able to allow communities to be able to engage at a district level. And by engaging uh, also then through that policy engagement, being able to unlock budget. So really allowing that finance to flow. Um, other areas of scaling also working not only at the district level, but scaling up into national programs of work um, um, like we have in South Africa, the Expanded Public Works Program. And then we really spoke about um, sort of the next steps is around evidence, you know, just needing more evidence, particularly
particularly at that kind of policy level for decision makers. Um, they need the, the evidence to be able to talk to their different performance areas or deliverables and making sure that we talk the language of the decision makers and those who are able to unlock uh, further opportunities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sasha. Um, I wouldn't attempt to <laughs> summarize all these good points, just to say that in the chat box, we also see more people emphasizing that the community need to have a voice, need to be involved in importance of local and indigenous people's knowledge. I think all the group has um, emphasized over and over again those multiple co-benefits, but of uh, obviously, those co-benefits need to be for the people. Um, but we do see that this is much easier to have communities voice in nature-based solution because they have been using it already. So they're more cost-effective. They can complement other technologies. We heard a lot about the multiple stakeholders and the partnerships that's important. And uh, we heard about the different scaling up repeated many times about champions, peer learning, behavioral change, and the technical financial incentives and bottom-up approach and the local embedded organization and community institutions. I think a lot of people feel like the long-term investment is really needed because the benefits also needs long-term to materialize. So that requires a different way to finance and the donor really needs a role to play uh, and we need responsive policies. So with that, I really want to thank all of you for sharing your thoughts in the chat box. And uh, Jenna, can yeah, so if we, you, we look at the screen now, um, so we just want to take the next few minutes before we close the discussion. We want to ask, have you sh again share with your thoughts with us today. We hope you enjoy the session, but at the same time, we hope you take something away from the session as well. So you can share in the chat box um, your response to this question, what is the most important lesson you learned today that you think you can take forward in your work beyond the CBA conference? And we would also want to invite back our speakers to give us the final reflections from all of you uh, on this question as well to kick start the conversation. So please, um, can we probably go to Rofida first? And again, all the participants, please feel free to share your thoughts in the chat box when you listen to the speakers. Rofida, over to you, please. One minute, quick last words. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, just um, I would, uh, the final um, thought that I, I would like to emphasize on that, uh, nature-based solutions works and, and, and they are easy to, for the communities to adapt and we are learning a lot from the communities on their skills on how to adapt to, to the climate change. It, it just needs more attention and 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 to be to be able to scale up the this and also to help these communities to be able to to adapt with the new and be more climate resilient and adapt to this new reality thank you thanks so much and then next to harrison please thanks uh uh Shia um i think the major highlight for me i will respond to the question on gender raised by one of the participants so I guess what we are trying to move from is just having large numbers of women participating in projects uh, because that can be a blind spot, but we really need an active process of learning and engaging with communities so that we really understand the different barriers of women and men to participate in developmental activities and outcomes as well as stepping into the knowledge and experiences that they have, particularly looking at women, their role in ensuring that families are fed. They do have quite a substantial knowledge around uh, um, seeds, varieties, and other NBS. So we really need to involve them actively and learn from them uh, and uh, improve their participation and their contribution. Thank you. Brilliant, the role of women, this is great. And then next, Philip, please. Yes, I think from the discussions, there's quite a lot of uh, great opportunity for, for NBS. I think and what we need is actually to package all this information 
that has been generated. Uh, and then uh, to actually provide um, development of a business case for NBS. The other issue is that uh, we have to see also explore opportunities of integrating the NBS with the non-NBS uh, solutions because in some, we should look at it as complementary and not a substitute of the other. Thank you. Great. Uh, again, integration with other technology as well. So last but not least, Annadelle, please. Thank you. Uh, I learned uh, that uh, sharing uh, between communities or individuals, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, ex exchanges are still very important in uh, promoting nature-based solutions. And uh, this is what I'm going to bring to our communities. Thank you. Thanks, and that's a great note to end on. I hope that every one of you have also learned from your peers today, and a thanks to all of you for this very informative and constructive discussion. I hope you enjoy the session as much as I have. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, a little bit five minutes over, but we hope you can continue the discussions through the CBA online platform. So for example, you can continue to discuss the nature-based solution technologies in the chat box for this session on Hoover. You can arrange meet up with the speakers or people you met during the session on the Hoover platform. You're also welcome to join other MBS and the technology sessions at CBA. So we hope we can continue to see you, hear you, learn from you from the, for the rest of the week and or even beyond CBA. So with that, we now officially close the session. Thanks so much, everyone.